Tuesday morning, we saw 11-month-old Amanda and her parents fly out of Wiley Post Airport. They had high hopes of getting a liver transplant to save Amanda. As we reported, surgery could not correct the liver damage, and a transplant was the last resort. Amanda was flown to a Minneapolis hospital to be evaluated for the organ transplant. Her condition was considered serious but stable. However, she had a rough time last night. She began bleeding and had a high fever. I talked with Melissa, her mother, by phone today. She told me a nurse gave them the sad news about Amanda today. She took us to a room and, um, and she sat us down and she said that, uh, that her liver was almost, they were almost gone already and her, there's a vein that they have to connect to her organ, her liver, when the organ comes in and the vein is, is way too small to cut. And they said that there is no hope for her anymore. And those are not easy words for any parent to hear. But Melissa says now she and her husband will bring the baby back to Oklahoma Children's Memorial Hospital, hopefully tomorrow. And then later, Amanda will be transferred back home to Eldis. Chickasha police detectives were busy today. Investigators cataloged 3,000 pictures of naked men and boys. Detectives confiscated the photos, film, and videotapes earlier this week during the porno raid. They arrested 38-year-old Chickasha travel agent James W. Parks, Jr. On the night of June 14th, uh, our patrol division uh, received a uh, call through uh, the dispatcher to respond to a residence in reference to two young juveniles being approached by an individual who offered them ten dollars an hour to pose in the nude. Investigators have asked the FBI to process undeveloped film found at the scene. The film could contain clues which would help prosecutors strengthen their case. Detectives say their investigation of this incident is continuing and there's a strong possibility they could file some future charges. Those charges could include solicitation of juveniles and possession of pornographic paraphernalia. Scott Wallace, News 4 in Chickasha. If the one cent sales tax boost goes through, water will be a priority. The proposed tax increase would generate an estimated $45 million a year for five years. Part of that money would be used at the Lake Stanley Draper Water Treatment Plant. This facility monitors the flow of water in and out of the city. 
Another 72-inch water main is desperately needed to keep up with the tremendous growth on the south side of Oklahoma City. The price tag on that project could run as high as $40 million. Road and bridge repair is also on the city's spending list. Southwest 104th Street between Pennsylvania and Western is already under repair. But other priority streets, like Northwest 122nd, will have to wait until more money is available. Of all the projects that would be funded by the tax increase, there is no project more urgent than a new sewage treatment facility. Oklahoma City does not comply with the Clean Water Act of 1972. A $20 million sewage treatment plant near the South Canadian drainage basin would correct that problem. But the plant needs to be built now. If it is not underway by September, the Environmental Protection Agency can invoke sanctions that could literally paralyze the Oklahoma City economy. If we miss that deadline, then we're subject to some fairly serious sanctions by the U.S. EPA uh, to include building moratorium in that area, to include $10,000 a day fines and, and until we correct that situation. Pay now or pay later is the ultimatum facing city voters. If the sales tax increase is turned down, the city manager says water and sewer bills could literally double. Either way, the new sewage treatment facility must be built. And even though voters said no to this same tax proposal in November, the city believes this pressing utility dilemma may sway enough votes to push the measure through. <laughs> Kurt Autry, News 4 at City Hall. Today, the public got its chance to tell the Transportation Department what it thinks of the $60 million plan to alleviate traffic congestion in Northwest Oklahoma City, specifically along May and Portland Avenues. The audience listened as the Transportation Department told how a freeway, at times six lanes wide, would connect Northwest 39th to Edmond Road and would expedite travel time. The road is not extended northward we will continue to experience one of the most intolerable traffic situations in Oklahoma City. If you're worried about the environment, go stand at Britton Road and May Avenue, or go stand on the Lake Road at any intersection and backed up two or three miles, and you'll get plenty of environment. And you better have a mask with you when you do it. If this man wants to see environment, I invite him to come over to my house some night and evening and watch the raccoons that'll eat out of my hand. After three years, I've trained him to do this. There are the duck ponds and the park to consider. A portion of Kids Lake would be required for freeway construction. Eight homes will have to come down, and some of those that remain will lose their view. There will be a loss of open space. The freeway will also eliminate this congestion. The northwest quadrant is the fastest growing area in the city. Traffic volumes will double in the next 20 years. Terry Cook, News 4. The ballot boxes began coming into the county election board shortly after the polls closed. The Oklahoma City Council had asked voters to decide whether they wanted to pay an extra penny in sales tax. They wouldn't have to wait long for an answer. The no's never lost their early lead. You might say the handwriting was on the computer printout from the time the returns began arriving. The measure failed to pass by a 3-2 to two margin. Opponents cheered the results. The big deal about a penny is it's not a penny. It's a very major part of the income out of our community and out of people's pockets. We're talking about the loss over five years of $225 million, and it's not just a penny. What's important here to realize is that the city has a budget for better than $200 million right now. And in that $200 million, they plan to fix those very things you're talking about and have come up with some pretty good ideas of how to cut money. What we have done is really just given them people a chance to vote yes or no, and, and that's fine with me, you know, because... Uh, uh, I believe in American democracy and I believe in the majority and we'll just do the best we can with what we have. The city council promised to tighten its budget belt by reducing garbage pickups and closing swimming pools. Scott Wallace, News 4 at the Hilton in West.
final decision based on my workup and recommendation. But it's a self-marketing program. Uh, SBA is a small agency. We've got less than 4,000 people nationwide, and we're doing billions and billions of dollars worth of contracts and loans. And uh, we tell all contractors that uh, we can give you the tools, huh, but you've got to go out and market that to the installations. You've got to go find the other federal agencies. You've got to do a lot of the homework. We'll help you, but we can't do it for you. so they can construct the highway under it. You have to do this one, you have to do it later on somewhere else. Well, I think this is the main issue. We're hopeful that if the people will uh, go with the voluntary water conservation, and that is not using any water that's not absolutely necessary, not sprinkling the lawns and not washing cars, uh, that we would not have much of a pressure reduction in the area. The Oklahoma Highway Safety Office is pleased that more motorists are choosing to buckle up. However, the campaign for using seatbelts is still going strong. Safety belt advocates are taking part in the Love and Protection Weekend starting tomorrow. And the message is, if you don't buckle up for yourself, then do it for the ones you love. Protect your whole family. You know, protect your, yourself for your children and protect your children so they'll be around, you know, through their formative years. And all you do is just hop up here? In order to be really convinced of the importance of seat belts, I was asked to take a ride on the Convincer. It's a simple machine that simulates the impact of a head-on collision at just seven miles per hour. This clearly demonstrates the force of a moving vehicle, and believe me, it can be very convincing. Holy Enough to make a person realize the value of using seat belts. You have a 50% better chance of surviving an accident, and, it, and even the odds are even better on you know, de defending yourself from a serious injury. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, people getting into the habit and being more aware of it. I think they ought to think of it as preventative medicine. You know, we, we do a lot of things now to keep our cholesterol levels down. People are jogging. Maybe not me, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are. This is just another form of preventive medicine when you really, you know, want to compare it that way. The convincer quickly gets the point across of just what force a minor accident can carry. Wow. That's why on a real highway at faster speeds, motorists should be real careful. So buckle up. Ed Stewart, News 4. that have no place to go. And so we want them back open. Even if we have to pay a dollar a child, they're free now, but even if we have to pay, we're willing to do that. Just don't close our parks. The first prisoner moved into the Granite State Reformatory while Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House. Inmates have lived here continuously ever since then. A few years ago, a federal judge ordered the state to move its convicts out of the cramped quarters. The inmates' new home will be this new $7 million housing unit. Office of Public Affairs inspectors spent the day touring the new facility. They must decide if the state is ready to buy the buildings. The new construction will transform the reformatory into essentially a new prison. There will be room for nearly 400 medium and maximum security inmates. 
Prison officials are eager to move into the new unit, but they may have to wait until some of the building's bugs are exterminated. We'll probably have some uh, problems as far as the mechanical operation of the units themselves. Uh, we'll probably have some uh, uh, problems uh, in our uh, uh, case management area. We're going to a, a unit management concept with the new buildings. Our staff is uh, totally unfamiliar with this. Uh, so we'll probably have some problems in this area, but uh, I don't anticipate anything that we can't work out. Last session, the state legislature requested that the old reformatory buildings be preserved for historic reasons. The state may also want to keep the old cell houses around just in case they're needed for future emergencies. Scott Wallace, News 4 at the Granite State Reformatory. The National Guard kept the water flowing into Asher long after the town's water system gave out. Governor Nye ordered the troops to supply drinking water to the town's 700 residents. On Easter Sunday, production from the town's two wells dropped from its normal 300 gallons per minute to less than 30 gallons per minute. But a lot of water has passed under the bridge since Easter Sunday. Today, the tiny town of Asher appears to have its water dilemma under control. A new well has been drilled, and construction on a new pipe to the town's water tower is underway. Mayor Dewey Harvey says the worst is over. We punched a hole here. We didn't know we were running a test hole. And we came up with a around 60 gallon a minute well. And with the recovery of this one, or what we got on this one, by the volume of we got from our old existing well, puts us up within 80%. Today, an inspector from the Water Resources Board surveyed the new project. He agrees that the problems have been solved. They uh, already had completed and refurbished the old, one of the old wells they have, and they drilled a new one here. They haven't tied it to the system yet. They anticipate an OGE to come by and tie on the electricity and then uh, finish laying the line and uh, hooking, it, hooking it up to the start pumping to the water tower. The new well should be pumping in less than a month, and plans are already underway for another well. And while this new water system is not a permanent fix, the flow should continue in this town for at least another 15 years. Kernotry News 4, Asher. While construction continues on the Lake Arcadia Recreation Area, a bitter battle is brewing between the city of Edmond and the town of Arcadia. Edmond officials want this area. In order to have it, they had to annex Arcadia. Most of Arcadia's 300 residents want to keep their quiet community independent. A petition to bring the matter to a vote was dismissed last night by Edmond officials. The petition fell short by 47 qualified signatures. But the battle is not over. People like Shirley Cox have vowed to fight the annexation to the end. She's been in Arcadia since 1956. To her and other residents here, it's a matter of pride. With mo mostly pride. There's a lot of old people that have their homes here, have been here for years and years, and can't come up to Edmund standards. And it's just not right to kick those old people out. We're still just three cents on the dollar. Sales tax will go to five and then probably we'll have to pay city property tax. Edmund officials are hoping the annexation will come off smoothly. They will file their petition in Oklahoma County next week. Arcadia residents have 10 days to appeal. Kevin Ogle, News 4, Arcadia.
this year. Senator Helms. Yeah, we got it. I've had overwhelming support from the people of Oklahoma, and I've had overwhelming support from many of the leaders of Oklahoma, and uh, their great concern has been the fact that I would run, and uh, as a result of running, not win the race, and then uh, be crippled in anything else that we might want to do in the future. And that, that one thing kept weighing very heavily on us. We have to serve everyone in town, so if we lose profitable customers, then that leaves us with the same investment that we had before these people came in and fewer people to pay the bill. So in essence, rates will go up. That's right. Uh -huh. Now, again... This guy particularly kind of struck a nerve with her, and she was, you know, very, she almost called the police herself, but she thought, well, you know, you get so many, you just really, after a while when you call Wolf, the police don't want to mess with you, which is certainly understandable. But uh, you begin to do that after a while, and I think you should kind of go ahead and call them no matter. The sheriff's office has attempted to verify the uh, information he gave. Um, so far they've been unable to find any records under that name with that date of birth. Uh, so they're attempting to cross-reference and um, just further verify whether that's who he really is. Contrary to what anything you might heard uh, from rumors, we are open for business tomorrow as usual, and we'll be here Tuesday morning in business. Bill Jennings was wrong. Four days after the Penn Square chairman predicted his bank could ride the storm, the comptroller of the currency ordered Oklahoma's fourth largest bank to cease and desist. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation quickly moved in. FDIC agents wasted no time in confiscating bank records and taking control of the loan portfolio. I want you to get to your neighbors and tell them that FDIC is operating this bank. We've got $11 billion backing up your deposits. We're the week following the cease and desist order would later prove the most chaotic. Thousands of depositors, some holding account books well over the $100,000 limit, waited in line. Many would never see their hard-earned money again. Well, I have over $200,000 in that bank, and I'm down here to get $100,000 of it. And uh, they tell us that we can get it today, then they'll give us a, I believe she called a pink slip that will be 
accounts receivable, and as the bank liquidates and as they get their loans in, then we will receive, I understand, either all or a part of the balance. To date, many of the uninsured Penn Square depositors have yet to receive their cash. Do you have a sworn statement that you wish to present to the committee? The collapse of Penn Square would eventually spark the interest of a congressional bank committee. Chief Energy Lending Officer Bill Patterson would be asked to tell of his involvement in the bank's failure. By late summer, executives with major lending institutions, including Continental of Illinois, Chase Manhattan, and Northern Trust, would admit to being taken in on participations with Oklahoma's largest oil and gas lender. In the years to follow, stories of Penn Square officers drinking champagne from cowboy boots would spread like wildfire through the banking community. And even though bank officials apparently could not see the end coming, looking back, the liquidator of Penn Square did have a firm grasp on the eventual outcome. Uh, the numerous uh, activities that uh, went on at this bank uh, uh, that have criminal aspects to them uh, far in excess of our expectations. People. You got a big smile. You got a smile, smile with your eyes. You ready? Yeah. Let's, Let's go. go. Throw a kiss. Big kiss. Oh, there you go. Where are we going? Right? Let's go home, baby boy. Tell him bye. Bye. Tell him bye. Tell him bye. <laughs> it's in the long run, they didn't give us a great deal of hope that he would make it at all through any of this. They said 50-50, uh, he'll either make it or he won't. And he's done it in flying colors. <laughs> The McDonald's in normally sleepy San Isidro is a place where children in the community often go. Carl and Wanda Hassley's babysitter took their two children there only yesterday. Sitters always do because there's no playground equipment here. So I let them walk down to McDonald's and, you know, Sorry. buy them an ice cream cone and play on the equipment. Come on, go! Move back! Move back! Go. Their children missed yesterday's carnage by 20 minutes, but other children were caught in it. Five died. Joshua Coleman was lucky. And me and my friends um, went over to McDonald's. They put down our bikes, and this man called us, and we looked at him, and the guy just shot us inside the McDonald's. What did you do? Nothing, I just laid down. He pretended he was dead. A few others were lucky. So now I go, he goes, um, they're shooting up there, man, I don't know. So we just opened the, um, this door from this room and we just hid in there. Mayor Hedgecock of San Diego described the unlucky ones as he saw them. The automatic weapon is still on the floor in there. The individual um, who was using it is on the floor. He's surrounded by uh, bodies. It is a terrible, gruesome sight. The man who did that, James Huberty, lived just up the street. It was his daughter who was the babysitter for Carl and Wanda Hassley. Together, they could see it all from their balcony. I was with her when she spotted the family car in the parking lot. We were standing up here at the opening of the complex, and she didn't know that her father was involved. Her father was involved, and the 20 human individuals who, because of him, never will do whatever they were going to do after McDonald's. Frank Berghalter, NBC News, San Diego.